Good afternoon. Um, I've caught you just after lunch, which either means you're going to be really happy and fed or really sleepy. Um, I hope it's the first one. Um, I'm Michael. Um, this talk will be in English. Um, you don't want it in French from me. Um, I'm mheap on Twitter. If you want to say nice things about the talk, if you want to say bad things, please don't put it on the internet. Just come and find me afterwards. But you're here because you want to talk about deployment. And as developers, we can write the most amazing code in the world, but until it's shipped, it doesn't exist for our customers. This means that deployment for most of us tends to be a mixture of excitement because customers are going to get to see what we wrote and stress because what if it breaks? What if it doesn't work quite how it should have done? There is a way through this. If you take one thing away from this talk, make it this. This is from Zach Holman, who was an early hire at GitHub, and he believes that your deploys should be as boring, straightforward, and stress-free as possible. If you take nothing else away, remember this sentence. So, welcome to Deployment for Beginners. Um, today we're going to define what a deployment is, take a look at five ways to deploy, from the easiest to the hardest, and then we'll cover a few deployment techniques that I've learned over the years that make it a little bit nicer to work with. Sound good? Okay, let's get started. What is a deployment? The easy one is, it's, it's code. We write code, we ship it. But it's so much more than that. Sometimes in a deployment, code doesn't actually change. Sometimes your dependencies change. Sometimes the configuration file changes. All of these need a new deployment to staging to production and they change how your application behaves. What about database migrations? What about other migrations? Files used to live in a certain folder on disk, now they need moving to another. What about assets? What if you want to change your company logo to be a Christmas version on the 20th of December? You need a deployment for that. Things change. For lots, for lots of reasons. It's not just when we make a code change. A deployment can be triggered by half a dozen different things. The one that p most people miss is things that change after a deployment. So the post-install tasks like running database migrations, moving media, and I'll make sure to cover that in a little bit more detail later in the talk. Now, can you remember the first slide that I asked you, you to remember? What are we aiming for? Come on. We're aiming for deploys to be as boring, straightforward, and stress-free as possible. But before you can deploy anything, you will need a code base. And I put together a, a small app just to put this talk together. And it's a simple to-do list application. It uses Composer, it's built with Silex, and it has Doctrine migrations. I built it in an afternoon. It doesn't do much, but it's enough. It delivers value. We can ship it, you can view a post, you can add a post, that kind of thing. So I needed to get it onto a server somewhere. And I started right at the beginning. I used the thing that needed the, the least effort from me and I was using an external tool. And this works for most people. There are a ton of options out there for this that take your repository and push it out to a server. One of these options is Beanstalk, and I'll show you how that works today. But this is very similar for any of the options out there. This is by no means the best of the worst. It's just one that I've had experience with in the past. Now, Beanstalk handles your entire project, including your version control system. So the first thing we needed to do was create a Git repo and push our code to it. And once we had that, it was nice and easy to deploy to a server. Now, Beanstalk has a, the concept of environments. So you might have dev, you might have staging, you might have production, um, whatever you want. They don't enforce anything, you just give them whatever name you like. 
and an environment is just a collection of deployment steps and servers to run those commands on. When setting up an environment, you can also decide whether the deployments are automatic and manual to that environment. If it's automatic, every time someone commits to the repository, that will get deployed. When creating an environment, you need to tell it how to deploy as well. Here, we tell it to upload over SFTP, which is the um, most basic way to get files on to a server in a secure manner. We tell it which protocol to use, we tell it which server to deploy to, and where on that server the file should live. And then finally, we add exclusions for files that we don't really want to deploy, ones that we need to ignore, along with any post-deployment commands. The post-deployment commands are interesting, I mentioned them earlier. Um, in this situation, it's where we'll run Composer install and our doctrine migrations. So in the black box at the bottom, I've just said run Composer install, then vendor bin, doctrine migrations, and pass it the location of the config file to use. There was quite a lot to set up there, but that was a one-time job. We've created an environment, we've created deployment scripts, and we can just press the button and it will do it over and over and over again. When we choose a deployment, it tells us exactly what's going to happen, and asks for a short message explaining what has been deployed. Here, we can see that it goes from scratch, which is nothing, to the latest commit hash in the repo. And once we hit proceed, it'll attempt to deploy the code. And you'll get an activity log. Um, here you see that the first deploy actually failed. Um, I forgot to set up the user on the server. But once I did create it, it all worked fine. The code was on the server in the correct location. It run Composer and it run my migrations as well. And as I set this up to be an automatic deployment, the next time I committed codes to the repo and, it, and pushed it, Beanstalk detected that and it automatically ran all of the steps. It ran Composer install again, it ran Doctrine migrations and it just appears in my changelog. And you can tell it's automatic by the little circle around my face. There are loads of different deployment tools out there, um, each with their own subtleties um, I covered Beanstalk, but there's also Deploy HQ, um, Laravel Forge, they're equally powerful. Just have a play, decide which one you like the most. The important thing is that you use a system like this, not which one you use. That's really all there is to using the hosted service. You point them at a repo, give it some commands, and then each time you need to deploy, you just you click play and it does it over and over again. Computers are very good at doing the same thing over and over again. It's nice and easy to get started. If you're currently working with FTP servers uh, to get your projects live, this is a good first step. There are issues though, such as partial deploys, if you lose connection halfway through a deploy, and a lack of flexibility for anything that doesn't fit within their system. It is worth mentioning that instead of running Composer as a post-install task, you can run that locally and commit all of your vendor files. But that makes the deploy take even longer and increases the risk of a partial deploy. Once you outgrow that external tool, it's time to bring it in-house, use an internal tool. There are tons of options out there. Uh, for ones written in PHP, you can look at things like Rocketeer, but the gold standard for many years has been Capistrano. Now, Capistrano is a Ruby tool, so you have to install it through RubyGems. And it is primarily a command line tool. So we're going to be seeing a lot of terminal output in the next couple of slides. First, you run cap install to initialize a project. And it makes some assumptions it assumes that you have a production and a staging environment, for example. I only have production for this. So we go, we ship straight to production. 
We set some defaults for all environments in deploy.rb. We lock the version of Capture Toronto to 3.6.1 because things do change between minor versions. And then we give it the application's name, where it lives on the server, and the URL to our Git repo. And you might notice this time it's a GitHub URL. With Capture Toronto, you don't have to use someone else's hosted service. You can use whatever version control system you're currently using. Then we set up each environment. Um, as I mentioned, I've only got production. We define a server. We tell it what user to run as on that server. And we give it a list of roles for the server. And I've said that this, this server is both an application server and a database server. And that's important in about two slides. If we run cap production deploy, you'll get a load of text. You probably can't read that. But it does something similar to this. It generates a deployment script, it clones our repo, and it generates an archive from the files in there. This is important, as it means no .git files in our live deployment. It uploads that to the server, untoys it into the releases folder, and then it symlinks the current folder, which is where all your users are looking, to that specific release. And whilst this is a great start, your code has been shipped. It won't actually work for our users, because we forgot to run Composer install and our database migrations. There are two ways to solve these problems. One is to write it yourself, or the second is to use the Composer, um, Capture on Composer gem, which will handle running Composer for you. This gem takes care of running Composer install, and importantly, it hooks into the Capture on lifecycle and runs it before the symlink is changed, which means your application should never be in a broken state. If we run Cap Production Deploy again, it runs the same steps, but before it symlinks, it runs the Composer run stage, which downloads all of our dependencies. At this point, we're almost there, but we still need to run our migrations, and sadly, this does involve some custom scripting. This is what's known as a rake task, and rake is a task runner for Ruby. If we walk through it, it's not too bad, we tell Rake that our task lives in the database namespace, that the task is called migrate. It should run on hosts that have the DB role. Remember that from earlier? That's why it's important that you give accurate roles to your servers. And finally, we give it the command that should run. Release path is a special capture on or global that points to the path where your code has been uploaded to. Um, and it's just, they're like magic for you to use. And this is exactly the same command as you pasted into that black box in Beanstalk. Vendor bin, doctrine migrations, migrations migrate. Exactly the same, just now it's committed to your repo rather than in a web interface. And then we have to hook it into our, our install pipe, our deployment pipeline and we want it to run just after Composer install has run. And then if we run cap production deploy again, it will automatically run any migrations that need to be run. And after a few deployments, you'll start to build up a folder structure that looks like this. There's a revision log showing every deployment, what you changed from and to, and who triggered it. If there are any issues going forwards, Capstrano will automatically change the symlink back to the, to the release before. We don't overwrite files and there's no way to go back. That's one of the advantages of having this release folder. We keep three, four, five previous releases and we can switch to any of them instantly. Now I've covered Capstrano on the command line today, uh, but there are other options, such as Webistrano, which is Capstrano with a web interface. There's Rocketeer, if you want something written in PHP, 
or you could use an orchestration tool such as Ansible if you want something with a little bit more power. And just like a hosted service, there's one click or one command deploys, environment support, and it forces you to commit before you deploy. No more, just I'll make a quick change and upload it by hand. There is a process now for deployment. But there's even more benefits this time. You're not dependent on anyone else to, d to deploy your code. If the third party service is down, you can still deploy. It has support for atomic deployments, thanks to Simlinks. And it has support for rolling back releases, as well as pushing forward. On the negative side, there, there is a little bit of a learning curve. It took me years before I understood this. A actual years. So it's not easy by any means. But the benefits are definitely worth it. We're still running Composer on the server, which isn't ideal. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it could be better. And there are no defined build steps. Everything you commit gets released. There is nothing in the middle. All in all, though, it's a big step in the right direction. Which brings us on to option C, using system packages. This is where things start to get really complicated. And I didn't really understand this until I joined a company called DataSift. Um, by the time I left there, I will never do it any other way. This is where you build a package for your target distribution, whether you're targeting CentOS and you need an RPM, or Ubuntu and you need a .deb file. You actually build a system package for your application. That means we're building on the shoulders of giants. We're not building our own deployment scripts anymore. We're using the built-in package manager that was written by people who spend their life writing package managers. It also assumes that you have complete control over the machine that you're deploying to, which might rule it out for some people. When using system packages, the process is exactly the same as when you install PHP or MySQL. You use apt-get, you use yum, or you use pacman. I've had the most experience writing RPM specs for CentOS, um, but this works really well on all of the different distributions. This is part of an example RPM spec file. Um, it's the one for PHP 7, actually written by Remy, who's around here somewhere today. Um, this is one of the more complicated ones that I've seen, weighing in at 2,951 lines. The shortest I've seen is about 30. And you can learn to write these yourselves. Um, sadly, I did. But like most other things, there's a simpler way to do it. Now I use a tool called FPM. Um, FPM stands for Effing Packing Ma Package Manager, and it's a tool that will generate RPMs, Debian files, anything you want. And FPM's fundamental principle is that if FPM is not helping you make packages, it's a bug in FPM. Using it, you can generate Debs, RPMs, you can generate uh, packages from Mac OS. You don't need to know the internals of how each packaging system works. You just need to know how to use FPM. To give you an idea how it works, here is my to-do list application from earlier. We have a source folder that contains our code and config, as well as some development resources and some tests that we don't want to ship. So the first thing I do is tell FPM that we want to build from a directory. That's our input. And we want an RPM as our output. And our RPM should be called to do. So S for source, T for target, N for name. Next, we need to map the files on disk to the location once they've been installed. So you use source equals destination as the notation. Here we say that everything in the source folder should be installed to void www to do. And everything in source config should be installed to slash etc slash to do. We want to mark anything in slash etc as a config file, which means that when we upgrade our package, it won't be overwritten, just in case we've made any changes on the live server ourselves. And finally, we want to remove the config files from void www to do config because they exist in slash etc to do 
And if they're in two places, people get really confused which ones it's actually using. To do this, we can use the exclude filter. Uh, be careful not to add a leading slash here, otherwise it won't match. And at this point, it will build as an IPM. Leaves us with this request. Use FPM to build a package where its source is a directory and its target is an IPM. Anything in slash etc is a config file. We don't want to package the config folder in source. Everything in source should live in void www to do. And anything in source config should live in, live in slash etc to do. Right, as you read it, it makes sense. You just build it up piece by piece. And now, it is possible to build these packages on your local machine and copy them into your package repository or onto a machine to install. Uh, but things are starting to get a little bit complicated now, which provides us with a quick detour into continuous integration. Because would it really be a deployment talk if we didn't mention continuous integration? Continuous integration, or CI, is a way to automatically run all of your tests and build processes whenever something in your code base changes. Just like the hosted deployment script, it watches your repo, and when it, whenever anything changes, it runs a script. People always think of CI as a way to run tests, but it can do so much more. It can run Composer install before you even get to your live servers. What if some of your dependencies need compiling? You need an identical version of the OS to production. You can't use your local machine anymore. But you can have several different build machines in your CI system, one for each operating system, that matches exactly. And it runs, it compiles, and it just saves the output for use later. We just looked at FPM. CI systems can package your dependencies. So now, any time you commit to GitHub, your CI system will detect it, run Composer install, compile any dependencies, assets, and generate a package for you, ready to install. You didn't have to do anything. CI is all about automating things. If you currently have a process that you do by hand, create a job for it in your CI system. You can still trigger it by hand if you want. It's got a nice big play button that you just go and click, but it means that it's a known environment not just your local developer machine, and it becomes a single click to run rather than chain deployment scripts. Computers are very good at doing the same thing over and over. Let them do it. There are a ton of options out there. Um, Travis is a popular open source option. Uh, there's GoCD, Concourse, Drone.io, uh, but Jenkins is probably the biggest one out there. It's been around for years. Um, version 2 came out at the end of last year. It's a big upgrade, including the ability to define your build pipelines as code and commit them to your repository. It's not just clicking through a UI in Jenkins anymore. You actually build your build scripts using code and commit them like the rest of your application. It doesn't matter which you use, but I highly recommend choosing one and just trying it out. So back to option C, system packages. We have our system package built, and we might even have used the CI system to do it. Now, all that's left to do is get it installed, right? Almost. We don't have to worry about running Composer install anymore. So that was done on our CI system, and all of the files are in the package. But we can't run database migrations offline. We have to be on the server to do that. There are a lot of different ways to do this. I know some companies still like taking um, SQL queries from tickets and copying and pasting them and running them by hand because they like the control that that affords them. Um, I'm still a fan of doing that, but there are alternatives if you want to run in a fully automated system. S it's a simple change to make. We go from this, which we already had, to this. And this says, after the package has been installed, run this script, and that script can be anything you like. It can run database migrations, it can send you an email, absolutely anything. For building system packages, all you need is FPM, and either RPM, DEB, or 
the type of package manager that you want to use installed on your local machine. If you have a Jenkins instance available to use, even better. One important thing to note is that releases are immutable. One single build should go through test, staging and production. We don't build, rebuild for different environments. If you build version 2.4.7, you notice there's a typo. You don't fix 2.4.7, you build 2.4.8. Version 2.4.7 will have that typo in it for the rest of time. This is a core part of building packages in continuous integration systems. If they're not immutable, you start to lose a lot of benefits that packaging provides. And at this point, the pros column is starting to outweigh the cons. This level of deployment is pretty awesome and is enough for most companies. It provides atomic releases, easy upgrade and rollback, a proper build toolchain, including signed builds if you need them. It builds on top of system tools maintained by people that do it as their full-time job. And don't forget, releases are immutable. If it worked once, it'll work in the future as well. However, none of this comes for free. The learning curve for this is even steeper than Capistrano. You need to build all of these packages. You need a way to distribute them to all your servers. And ideally, be running a continuous integration system too. In fact, there's no guarantee that just because it works in staging, it'll work in production. Because the environments might be slightly different. You might be running CentOS 6 in staging, CentOS 7 in production, a different version of PHP. Um, live user data might be a little bit different. There could be any number of reasons. Blue-green deployments is an option to help solve that as well. Um, it's a fancy name for a simple concept. The general idea is that you have two production environments, one called blue, one called green. Your customers are all using the blue one at the minute. So you deploy your release to green and you do some internal testing. And then you decide you're happy with that. And you switch your load balance to point to green and all your customers start getting directed to it. And then you start preparing your next release on the blue cluster. And once you're happy with that, you redirect traffic back. And that's really all there is to blue-green deployments. It's a fancy name for a really simple concept. You're just flipping between two environments. There are some good questions around whether the two environments should share a database. Ideally, they wouldn't. But in practice, most people do just use a shared database. You can set up all kinds of clusters with master-master replication to get around this. But honestly, the majority of companies just use a single database and they ensure that the, the changes that they're making are both forwards and backwards compatible. This allows you to move both forwards and backwards with your data model if you need to roll back a release if something goes wrong. But once you start having two sets of identical systems, you need a way to keep them in sync. You could do this by hand, but really you want to be using a system like Puppet or Chef or Ansible. Now, configuration management is a, a whole talk on its own. Um, if you're interested in learning more, grab me afterwards and we can have a chat about it. Or, and this is shameless self-promotion, there is a fantastic book about this. Um, it's called Ansible Beginner to Pro, and it takes you from knowing nothing about Ansible to automatically spinning up an Amazon AWS instance and deploying WordPress to it, database and all. It's nice and short, maybe 150 pages, but it, it works. I mean, I went through it 20 or 30 times and other people have worked through it and they knew nothing. And by the end they had a automated install of WordPress. It's important to note that all of this is done at an infrastructure level not an application level. This isn't about enabling some features for some users and not for others. This is about deploying a version of your application to a new set of hardware and moving all of your customers at once. This is a hard switch from one set of hardware to another. It might not be an instant switch, it might take a few minutes, but that's okay. As mentioned, you'll need some form of configuration management to keep these in sync. Um, it doesn't matter which you use, um, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, 
I actually really like Puppet. Uh, not Puppet, Chef. Um, I use it day to day. It doesn't matter which you use. Just choose one. And blue-green deployments are awesome if you have the resources. Most companies won't run two copies of production for cost reasons, which is fair enough. There are a lot of more a lot of moving parts with low balances and different environments to manage. And the database synchronization issue is still a hard one. But with this method, your deploys become a lot safer. All of your changes are performed offline, database migrations, code updates, and you test them internally before putting your customers on there. Which is as simple as just flicking a flag to say, go to blue, not green, or go to green, not blue. Which brings us on to our final option. It's even bigger than blue-green, which is immutable infrastructure. It's very similar to blue-green, but with one important change. Once you build a server, you can never change it. The idea is the same. You start on blue, you do a release on green, you send traffic to green. But at this point, you delete your blue cluster. It served its job, now it's gone. You need to be sure that you don't want to roll back. But once you are, get rid of it. Because each new deploy has a new set of machines built and tested. We go from green to orange to purple. And green has disappeared because if we roll back, we're going to go to orange. Why is this idea of immutable a good thing? Well, imagine that you're managing a blue-green deployment. You're using Puppet or Chef or Ansible, and everything's going well. But then you push a new feature to green, and it needs a new package. You're allowing users to resize their profile images, and you need to install GD, like a system library. Your green environment now has that dependency installed. But during testing, you find a fundamental flaw with the feature that didn't show up earlier, and it's cancelled. So the release is rolled back. But unfortunately, rolling back an infrastructure change isn't that easy. You've installed a package on the system. The opposite of an install isn't a rollback. It's an uninstall. You've got to move forwards to go backwards in infrastructure. That green environment is now tainted. It doesn't look like what you're expecting. But with immutable infrastructure, when the release goes, so does the hardware. That entire set of machines is gone. And the next feature gets its own set of machines in a state that we know about. It has no lingering issues. And it's not just configuration management issues that can cause machines to become snowflakes. It could be manual changes that people make. Um, it could be any number of things. But we want our machines to be phoenixes, capable of being torn down, rebuilt in minutes. We don't want them to become snowflakes, which they're all lovely and unique, but they're very hard to reproduce. There are a few useful tools when working with immutable infrastructure. And the first is a configuration management system. You'll use that to build your base boxes. But you use that in conjunction with a tool like Packer. And what Packer does is it generates an image. And that image is immutable, just like you release. And it has everything pre-installed. It has your software pre-installed. And when you want to launch it, you just upload that entire image to AWS, Azure, wherever you want. That release will sit there forever. If you ever want to go back to version 1.4.7, you just launch the image that has 1.4.7 on it, and it will always work. There is no, oh, well, we upgraded PHP, and now it won't work anymore that image is static for the rest of time. This is only really feasible if you use a cloud provider like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or some form of virtualization technology. So if you're running your own hardware, you might choose something like OpenStack. Immutable infrastructure takes blue-green deployment to the next level. You always know what state the environment is in. And you can test as many releases in parallel as you like. Just create more environments. But th with that flexibility comes complexity and cost. Building these environments takes time and money. 
and database synchronization becomes even more of an issue the more environments you have. So, five different ways you can deploy code from easiest to hardest. Most people end up somewhere in the middle, but do what works for you. Just to wrap up, there are a few deployment techniques that I quickly want to cover. Uh, the first is actually nothing to do with deployment. It's about being deployment ready. Even if you don't ship every day, make sure that you can build your project every single day. Otherwise, when it comes to build time, you might get stuck realizing that your app doesn't build anymore. You've got three days to get a release candidate out and no one can build it. Once you have a release, there might be lots of different aspects to it. Codes, configuration, database migrations. Tell everyone about the changes that you're making. This might just be telling customers that there's an at-risk window. It might be internal people. You might give your DBA a heads up to say I'm going to make some database changes next, uh, next week on Wednesday. Tell the people that wrote the code that you're deploying. The more people looking at logs and graphs whilst you deploy, the better during, an during a deployment because if something goes wrong, people will spot it very quickly. And with all these different things changing, stagger the changes. You don't have to change the code and the database and the config all at once. Make the database change first because your, your changes should be forwards and backwards compatible. Change the config, change the code, minimize the risk of the deployment. Canary deploys. You can either deploy your application and enable features for a small subset of users, or you might deploy to a small subset of servers. Both are Canary deploys, slightly different implications, but it's a way for testing that the changes that you make don't have a negative impact on your user base. You can deploy to one or two servers, monitor them, make sure no new errors show up before rolling it out to the rest of your system. Integrate go and no-go steps into your deployment. If, you know, if you're releasing to a few Canary servers, know what log messages you're looking for and make sure you know beforehand. Once you start deploying, people, they tend to just push forward if you have a list of go or no go criteria before you start, as soon as you hit one, it's easy to pull the plug. And containers. Containers can help with deployments by providing atomic releases that you ship and run. No need to worry about what state the production server is in because your container has everything that you need to run your application. If it works in staging, it should work in prod. It also gives us all of the benefits of an immutable infrastructure as the containers are built for each release. So this might be a slightly more cost-effective way um, to do immutable releases rather than spinning up new machines all the time. And as a bonus, you can use a, a single server for blue-green deployments if you like. Automate your deployment. I'm a huge fan of automation. It doesn't matter whether you're using an external tool, a small shell script, a full-blown deployment system. Remove the ability for humans to make mistakes. Make sure that you're running everything you can before a release. It doesn't mean that you have to build on your local machine, just that you shouldn't be running composer or minifying assets on the production system. Do it locally, do it on the CI system, anywhere but your live site. Make those builds immutable. Once a release is generated, that release number is gone. Use an incrementing number for releases. You might follow semantic versioning, or you might just use the current date and time. Both work, so long as it always goes up and never repeats. But perhaps the most important thing is to plan your deployment before you start deploying code. How do you react to a, fail a failure? Do you roll back? Do you fix and push forwards? Are there any additional steps you need to run after the deployment? And what checks can you run afterwards to make sure it was successful? It is very tempting to keep pushing forward with the deployment, trying to resolve problems, but most of the time, this results in a team that still hasn't solved the problem 12 hours later and is no longer in a position to roll back if they wanted to. This one's from Laura Thompson at Mozilla, and the rule says, if three or more things have gone wrong, roll back. I take it one step further. If I have to do three things 
that weren't on my deployment plan. The release is cancelled. People should know what needs doing for deployment step by step. It's no good them saying, oh, I forgot we need to do this halfway through. That counts as one of the three. And finally, make it a single command. Make sure that you can roll out and roll back just by running one command. Because after all, that's how we make our deploys as boring, straightforward, and as stress-free as possible. If you have any questions, feel free to grab me. I'll be wandering around for the rest of the day and tomorrow. Uh, mention me on Twitter or drop me an email. And, of course, any feedback on joined in will be appreciated. Thank you.